The Resident Evil franchise has been around for pretty much as long as I've been alive, and over that upsettingly long period of time, many titles in the series have tried to branch off from the mainline entries and find success in the form of spin-offs. These ranging from so good they're better than some of the numbered games, and so unbelievably bad they make us want to give Mr. X an angry slap on the ass in the hope he'll decide to smash our head in. So despite stumbling over my own words every single time I tried to pronounce the franchise's name, I thought I'd waste a significant portion of my own private free time briefly reviewing every single Resident Evil spin-off game. Well, the ones that are worth talking about at least. I'm not going through the stupid dreck that the multiplayer games turn out to be. And please, keep in mind while watching, I'm not a smart person, so this isn't going to be one of those big on details kind of videos. Right, now that's out of the way and you've all considered leaving a premature like on this video, let's shamble on and start off with the most prominent and deserving of the Resident Evil title, and probably the next one they'll remake maybe, Code Veronica. Code Veronica is like that weird cousin you only see at family reunions. He sort of looks like the rest of the family, but no one is 100% sure that they weren't adopted. In many ways, Code Veronica is the most Resident Evil game to ever Resident Evil. It's tense, it's difficult, the puzzles are challenging, and it's goofy as all hell. Compared to the first two Resident Evil titles, Code Veronica is the desperately overachieving red-headed stepchild. It has a more complex story, deeper characterization, and new gameplay mechanics that, for better or worse, make it stand out from the rest of the family. A lot of this all kind of sounds overwhelmingly positive, and when it all works, it is. But like I said moments ago, Code Veronica seems focused on being the purest Resident Evil experience yet which can be very tiring. That complex story, while entertaining, is so batshit crazy, it's making Yakuza games blush. Mush mush. Those new gameplay mechanics and the increased difficulty can lead to certain areas being impossible if the player didn't somehow read the game's mind and get pre-prepped for them. And the deeper characterization meant the game tried to make us care about this guy. Father! In a lot of ways, it almost feels like course correction after the less enthusiastic reception to Resident Evil 3. While RE3 wanted to suddenly shock the player into pooing their pants, Code Veronica wants the more methodical paced creeping tension to slowly squeeze the poo out of its players. Which is a theory made all the more rational when remembering that Code Veronica was originally supposed to be Resident Evil 3 before Capcom decided to push the third entry into a more action oriented direction, because that has never been a bad idea. Nope, not once. Anyway, uh, I think it's pretty good as far as spin-off side adventures go. Since I'm now done with Code Veronica, I may as well move on to reviewing Code Veronica. Oh wait, no, sorry, that's Survivor 2 Code Veronica. Eh, I may as well talk about Survivor 1 while I'm at it. If any Resident Evil game made me question my love for this franchise, it was Umbrella Corps, but the Survivor games are a close second and third. Somehow, they managed to make the tank controls even clunkier. The last thing the early Resi games needed was to be first person, but the Survivor games take it a step further by throwing in some wonky hit detection and overly bullet spongy zombies as a rotten cherry on top of this mishmash cake. I mean, at least you could use the cheap plastic gun that Sony decided it wanted to be a big thing for about a week. Survivor 2 does have some minor improvements that make it less hateable, and at least it has the decency to reveal that it was all a dream at the end. But even so, I still think we've got ourselves a couple of spin-offs that we should be glad are mostly forgotten. However, just like every mutant creature worth firing a rocket launcher at, the Survivor games twisted violently into a new form, which leads us nicely onto Dead Aim. Spiritually, the third game in the Survivor trilogy, Dead Aim takes the first-person arcade-like perspective and unapologetically forces it together with the more traditional movement style. Uh, that's traditional for Resident Evil standards, so I actually mean like a blind snail walking on stilts. 
Now, I'm not saying that Dead Aim doesn't come with a few welcome additions after two very bland wastes of code. The Desolate Cruise Liner is maybe one of my favourite settings in any Resident Evil game. While the sound design isn't anything worth shouting about, the echoing silence only permeated by the protagonist's footsteps, the occasional groan of the ship's distant machinery, and the unsettling moan of an unseen zombie waiting to shamble around a corner, or all work perfectly together with the heavily shadowed corridors to create an atmosphere that scared the living shit out of me as a kid. Between the setting and the unique combat controls, Dead Aim, in a way, proves to be a nice change-up from the standard Resident Evil affair, but one that's held back by weak characterization, cringy writing, and Rezzy's affection for terribly over-the-top dialogue being at such an all-time high that it's getting side-eyed by Snoop Dogg. For many reasons, most of which are these games' own fault, the light gun-focused Resi games never managed to find solid enough ground to make them really worth mechanically exploring further. That is until Nintendo only went and revolutionised the entire gaming landscape by releasing the Wii. A console specifically designed for random gimmicks, intertwined with cheap, crappy controller paraphernalia, seemed to be the perfect, respectable place for this style of gameplay to call home. Enter the Umbrella and Darkseid Chronicles. Featuring rehashed versions of everyone's favourite Resident Evil stories, the supposed point of these games was to allow fans a fresh new way of experiencing the franchise's classic moments. The first Chronicles feels the most like a greatest hits collection. Chronicling the events of 1, 3, and 0, as well as a final chapter of new, never-before-seen lore content that will, of course, never be referenced or mentioned again ever by any other entry in the franchise. It's basically House of the Dead with a classic Resi Evil skin, which is actually good, I think. I think it's quite good. Although the best thing this one has to offer is Wesker's narration and the way he says zombies. It metamorphosed them into living death. Zombies. Zombies. The sequel, Darkseid Chronicles, loosely retells the events of Resident Evil 2, as well as Code Veronica, and again features scenarios made up of new material so unintrusive to the canon that they may as well have slapped a don't worry about any of this bollocks disclaimer in every cutscene. At least we get a vague nod to it in the RE4 remake, I, I guess. Still, there's some quality of life improvements that make it a smoother experience than Umbrella Chronicles, as well as a tighter lean into co-op that makes this the preferable choice of the two for me. Essentially, if you like House of the Dead, it's pretty fun. Okay, moving on from side content Capcom threw together, let's talk about the spin-offs that I feel are pretty much solely responsible for Resident Evil 7 swerving back towards its horror roots. Resident Evil Revelations and Revelations 2. After the embarrassing critical and commercial belly flop that Resident Evil 6 decided it would be, Capcom thought it best to look back at a smaller 3DS project they quietly released earlier that same year for their future inspiration, that being 2012's Revelations. To get lazy for a second, GameSpot said Revelations was a thoroughly successful crossbreeding of old school chills and new school action. Now, while I find crossbreeding morally despicable, I can't help but agree with GameSpot's evaluation. Once again, in a Resi spin-off, we're thrown into a spooky ship full of nasty things hell-bent on being violently mean to us. Or maybe they're just after Jill because of that ridiculously tight swimsuit. This time, our spin-off tries harder to make an impact on the series' timeline, but to a much more successful degree than Umbrella and Darkseid Chronicles. Set between Resident Evil 4 and Resident Evil 5, we're greeted with some familiar faces to follow. That being the future walking, boulder-punching steroid man, Chris Redfield, and the previously mentioned Jill Valentine. Hey, hey, her eyes are up here, and around the other side of her head. While they investigate a generic terrorist organization known as Veltram. But it's not terrorists you'll be shooting at. It's primarily big grey goopy boys that look like rejected concept art for Resi 4's regenerators. Oh, and hunters. Lots and lots of hunters. 
To be relatively fair, the enemies do offer a fairly wide variation of different types. Some are slow but strong, some are weak but fast, some are bullet sponges, and some just need a few well-placed shots, which you'd easily land if you could keep your eyes above Jill's waistline, please. Oh, you pervert! I would have preferred much more traditional zombies, so that's a clear instance where Dead Aim is a clean winner for me. I do get it though, this was originally a 3DS exclusive, and you've got to make the game look a little more family-friendly for the kiddies, or Nintendo might freak out. This is also a good place to mention that I'm not going to be looking at the Deadly Silence game. It's cute that it's on a handheld console, but it is ostensibly just Resi 1 with harder controls. As it is with any Resident Evil game, no matter how solid the experience is, there's always a few nasty bumps in the road. In Revelations, they're mostly because of the basic story that just lets itself fall into the background, some sections that drag on and really could have been cut, and this guy's fucking ridiculous design. As a ginger, I consider this a personal attack. Regardless of my hurt feelings though, Revelations did well enough to earn a PC and console port several months later, but more importantly, it also earned the upsettingly easy to achieve sequel, Revelations 2, which is special for one thing and one thing only. You can finally play a full resi game as Barry Burton. Sorry, did I say full resi game? Uh, I meant half a full resi game. You see, Revelations 2 came out in a gaming landscape where Telltale had long established that video games should be more like TV, and therefore released episodically, which for this type of game is stupid. It's a gimmick that I only feel really served to make this game more forgettable. Say what you want about Operation Raccoon City, but I remember Operation Raccoon City. Unlike Operation and Revelations 1 though, I actually quite enjoyed the story Revelations 2 put forward. There's plenty of twists and turns, all as deliciously stupid as you'd hope from the franchise at this point. Yet both the new and returning characters are surprisingly well developed. The combination of the seasoned veteran in Claire Redfield and the admittedly sometimes annoying PTSD ridden gunless sidekick Moira Burton is solid. Moira is the uh, kind of annoying that you'll either eventually find endearing, or rub you the wrong way harder than Nemesis through a glory hole. Have fun trying to get that image out of your head. It really is the relationships that keep the game's rather okay gameplay interesting. Watching Claire and Moira learn to effectively work together to survive, and Barry getting to explore his fatherly instincts as you try to protect and discover the mystery behind the little girl Natalie and her supernatural powers, both provide a much stronger foundation than the first revelation's big ship, spooky ass approach. And yeah, I did mean it that way round. There's also, of course, the raid mode, which is just the original Mercenaries concept slapped in for some added content, which is something I don't have a problem with. And including maps from other games is a surprisingly welcome addition that makes me yearn for a proper Mercenary spin-off even more than I have already yearned. Although it'd be nice if they weren't all from Resident Evil 6. That's probably a budget issue, though. Okay, I'm sick of Revelations now. Let's talk about maybe my favourite spin-off to earn a spot in this video, Resident Evil Outbreak, and Outbreak File 2. The Outbreak games follow a collection of nondescript characters with slightly unique abilities as they try to escape the same Raccoon City disaster from Resi 2 and 3. I've lumped the sequel together with its predecessor, mostly for time, but also because, aside from a few additional tweaks, they're both pretty much identical in terms of gameplay. Most notably, it was the first Resident Evil game to feature co-op, an especially interesting feat as it was exclusive to the PlayStation 2. Through the use of a PlayStation network adapter, you could play with up to four others across the vast expanse of space we unfortunately call home. It was also barely used, because who the fuck had a PlayStation network adapter for the handful of non-sports games that had online functionality? Also, many players would have found themselves locationally challenged, as Outbreak servers were only available in Japan and later North America. Which in hindsight is a real shame, because I would love to play a game like Outbreak now that internet connections are unfortunately the norm. Who, who is naming Daddy Longlegs? Why why is it that? I don't like that. Daddy Longlegs? What? 
who is naming this Daddy? And you know, I don't like Daddy Long Legs. Outbreak provides Resident Evil the opportunity to do what Resi does best throw you into a confusing landscape occupied by all sorts of nightmare creatures and letting you figure out how the hell you're supposed to escape. Unlike the other more structured entries, Outbreak doesn't even need to concern itself with narrative continuity. You've escaped through a sewer, now you're in a lab. How'd you get there? Why do you want to be there? Fuck knows, it faded to black, a new level started, and now I'm dealing with it. That's all I need. It works brilliantly because it allowed the devs to experiment with different locales, atmospheres, and enemies. And unlike the next spin-off we'll look at, which was also in a position to make use of the same narrative looseness, there's no shortage of monstrosities to soak up all your ammo and leave you running around through doors, searching like you're storming Takeshi's castle. Granted, most of these enemies are from previous Resi games, and the newer enemies are majoritively reskins of other monsters, but they're enough to keep the various levels from quickly getting stagnant. Honestly, why is this the only Resi game to have a zoo area? That is cool as shit, and way too interesting to never revisit. Outbreak's main strength is its ability to recover from any of its weaknesses. Not enjoying the level? That's alright, it'll be over soon and you can play the next one. Wasted all your ammo pissing around on pointless zombies? Eh, just restart. No need to mess around with ink ribbons and tactically saving in this entry. Now when I decide to virtually take on the undead hordes of Raccoon City, I used to use a typewriter, but then I was reliably informed that my brother lied to me because they don't have any electricity in them so you can't plug them into the console. Luckily, Akko were there to help me out by sending me this dope looking keyboard. Now I can clickety clack the undead to my heart's content, safe in the knowledge that I won't have to top up my gaming utensils with ink cartridges, which is what I've been doing for the past two decades. I honestly love this thing. It's sleek, it's classy, it makes this sound, and I reckon it's practically indestructible. At least this file from Resident Evil Code Veronica claiming it's the only thing to survive the Raccoon City nuclear disaster makes me assume that it is. Alright, in all seriousness, I've been really enjoying using this. Like every other piece of tech these days, the RBG colours are a vibe, and the sheer amount of customizable options is a mind blower for someone that never knew he wanted so many options for his keyboard. The keyboard also has a magnetic switch, and you can use the RT function and get better sensitivity and controllability. I could spend all day sifting through their app, looking at all the different combinations, which is great because I can be very particular when it comes to keyboards. If they're too big or the spacing between keys isn't right, then it ain't happening for me. This one, however, has been a comfortable dream to use. Whether you're gaming or whacking out a script talking about every single Resident Evil spin-off, this is a great keyboard to do it with. If you follow the link in the description and use code play it, you can start putting together your own keyboard and get 10% off your order while you're at it. All right, where was I? Outbreak does what a great spin-off should. Afford the opportunity to create something different within an established franchise without pushing so far to the point you're just creating a new game and slapping beloved branding on top. A product of its time in many ways and ahead of its time in others, the Outbreak formula could easily be revived for a modern release, and as far as I am concerned, is the only game that should be getting the remake treatment next. If you are actually interested in revisiting the Outbreak games, you actually still can. Through the power of emulation and the dedication of some real heroes who have created their own fan servers, the ability to play this classic Resi title cooperatively has been brought back from the dead. Get it? Because it's a zombie game. Do you get it? It's funny. It's a, it's a, it's a zombie joke. Remember a moment ago when I was talking about creating something so tonally different and just slapping pre-established branding on top? Yeah, well, Operation Raccoon City. What could be the biggest stain on what is already, let's be fair, mostly flimsy group of spin-offs, I've left this one till last because I actually have feelings towards this game that may rile up a few Resi lovers' feathers. I actually don't think it's all that bad. 
I mean, it, it, it is bad. I'm not even going to try and deny something so painfully obvious. But I still remember that March 22nd, all the way back in 2012, I got home from school only to find that my highly anticipated pre-order had arrived a day early. Not only that, my friend's copy had arrived a day early too. So we had a full Tuesday evening to play, a day at school to talk about it, and then a full weekend to finish it. Good fucking times. And while nostalgic childhood memories shouldn't be enough to excuse the uninspired level design, a story so uncaring that it lets you kill off main characters at the end, and some of Rezzy's least appealing controls, which is damn impressive coming from a franchise with an addiction to wonky control schemes, I still can't help but see the weird, terrible charm that shines through. I'm still baffled that the infection mechanic, where one of your own squad could turn into a zombie, hasn't been expanded upon in literally any other co-op zombie game. On paper, it's nothing crazy. Basically, if you don't use an antiviral spray, you'll turn, and your friends need to kill and revive you. Pretty unassuming as mechanics go. But this mechanic led to some of my favourite memories in a Resident Evil game, especially when playing on harder difficulties, where you're already overwhelmed by the handful of classic creatures the one-time Resi developer, Six Slant Games, could be arsed animating. Uh, side note, did anyone ever play Slant Six's SOCOM games? They were fucking incredible, and it pains me that no one really talks about them because they were some fucking great games. Anyways, Operation Raccoon City is maybe the most pointless spin-off on this list. It does nothing new with the story or characters, and it seems more preoccupied with copying Gears of War. Obviously, no one told them they were already six years too late on that one. And that is what Operation is. A rejected SOCOM released in an era where everything wanted that Gears of War money with the Resi branding slapped on top of it. And yet, even on a replay as an adult, I still find myself giving it some level of respect. It's a fairly lengthy game, so the value for money is clearly present, and the multiplayer does what the latest online-centered games couldn't do, and can actually be a bit of fun. I think this Google review sums it up best. <clears throat> Hank and his team, just awesome. It's solid. It got a lot of shit when it released. Most of it was reasonable, but it's still a solid entry in a franchise with much lower lows. Are you not missing one? I'm not talking about Gaiden. You probably should. Ugh, but it's a load of shit. You're a load of shit. Resident Evil Gaiden was shit when it came out in 2002, and it's shitter now. It tried something different, but it just ended up boring. Dull game design, pointless fighting systems, and absolutely ear-fuckingly bad audio choices. I know it has some kind of cult following now, probably because of the limited release exclusively on Game Boy Color, but I don't get it, man. I just, I don't see why this exists. The Game Boy Color was trying to be a big thing. They made a Game Boy Color Resi game. That's it. I have next to fuck all to say about it, because it has next to fuck all worth talking about. Thank you so much for watching this video. Sorry if there's a few games missing from the list that you feel should have been looked at. For those wondering where Deadly Silence is, to me it just feels like more of a Resi 1 demake than an actual spin-off. Uh, and the same goes for the Mercenaries 3DS game. And while Resi 0 might fit the bill for some, I've always considered it a mainline entry just because of the number. Uh, and the rest are all Japanese mobile games, and I don't want to go there. But what I do want is to know if I insulted your favourite Resident Evil spin-off. If so, good. Is there a spin-off from another franchise you'd like me to do an actual in-depth review of? Let us know any and all that down in the comments, and if you enjoyed, we'd appreciate it if you left a like, blah 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 blah, or even subscribe if you want to see more like this from our channel. We also have a Patreon for anyone willing and able to financially support the creation of new content, although times be tough, so, you know, we get it. Thank you again for watching, and cheers.